Thomas Martikainen, director of the Migration Institute of Finland. He is our co colleague and he, one of the partners of this uh, conference. And uh, Thomas will talk about what happened to the asylum seekers of uh, 2015 in Finland. Please, Thomas. Uh, thank you. I will uh, start with the story. I'm a participating in a project run by the Ministry of the Interior in Finland that is looking at the what they call the carrying capacity of Finns in terms of, uh, you know, asylum seekers, refugee-related issues. So they're trying to figure out basically how to improve uh, uh, Finland's capacity. It may something like what took place in uh, 2015 take place again? Well, in that context, when we've had meetings and there was uh, there are people from uh, the border guards, from the police from different NGOs, research institutions, ministries, and so on. There was one gentleman working for the Finnish Immigration Service who played a, uh, quite a central role in arranging the, uh, you know, taking care of the, of the whole issue. You know, people coming into the country uh, in rather unexpected ways. And he was very tired, they were doing long days, especially September, October were very, very uh, uh, busy times. He was tired. Going to his workplace, you know, after I mean, working all night and so on. And there we, he was going, and then he was looking, people in the neighboring department are just chatting, having their morning coffee in a regular way, you know, as if nothing in particular would have taken place. I think uh, this is basically the, the uh, anatomy of uh, what took place in 2015. For some people in the country, were they public officials, NGOs, it was a very, very hard time. But for the others, you know, nothing really changed. You know, people just kept on living as they were. Uh, uh, and, you know, the long-term effects, uh, you know, whatever they will be. Uh, we'll see. No, just uh, uh, many things have been mentioned. Here we see again a reminder of the um, uh, inflow of, um, of asylum seekers to Europe. And we see there's a small arrow up there uh, about the main way of entry uh, to Finland via northern Sweden. Uh, Finnish uh, businesses often, cl you know, uh, uh, when they're trying to explain to others that why we are, why things are more expensive in Finland, that you know, from a European perspective, Finland is an island. You know, we are an island, like, you know, other islands, because most of the stuff that comes to Finland is shipped. Uh, this was maybe one of the few times when uh, people were actually quite happy about that. I'm talking about public authorities now, because it made it very easy to control some of the central passageways, which were the boats, you know, the, the, the boat routes. So uh, uh, it, it was a very limited number of individuals who arrived that way. They were very uh, soon established a uh, different type of controls there to prevent. But that was not the case in northern uh, Finland, and we'll return to that in a minute. Uh, this uh, uh, map is, by the way, from a book that was published about a month and a half ago. It's in the Finnish language that sort of tries to summarize what took place in 2015. Uh, it's also available for those of you who know Finnish uh, online. Again, the numbers, we all know these, uh, September, October. Just was uh, reminded by the Swedish statistics that we saw. You know, you remember the figure 40,000. Okay, there's 4,000 for the case of Finland. You know, uh, are still a very large number in national context, but maybe just comparing to the country next door gives a perspective to that. <clears throat> now, what changed uh, uh, quite significantly, I would argue, was the geographical distribution, in this case of asylum seekers uh, uh, initially in the country. Uh, uh, the Finnish Immigration Service, uh, which is quite good in its uh, information services in general towards the media. They are very good on Twitter and uh, whatever, you name it. Uh, they always make news about, uh, about how much they have saved money. You know, we have closed down so, and mo so many centers, uh, um, and this was the basic news that we received uh, uh, for the uh, few years uh, before. You know, they're becoming more effective. 
But now this all changed uh, in a very short uh, period of time in the uh, autumn of uh, 2015. Suddenly, in a very rapid uh, pace, new uh, reception centers were found all around Finland. From a couple of handful, I think there were, um, in the spring 2015, there were under 20 uh, reception centers in Finland, if I recall now correctly. So the figure uh, at the end of the year was almost uh, 200. There are about a bit more than 300 municipalities in Finland. So that's meant that actually this was becoming a nationwide uh, experiment. And it went also so that uh, uh, people, of course, came by a, a certain very restricted number of entry points. Uh, then uh, there were bus, bus transportations were organized. So the bus left, for example, you know, uh, there in, um, in northern Finland before it knew where it was going to. So a couple of hours after driving towards the south, the bus driver was announced that where he's supposed to be. And then, you know, a couple of hours later, the reception center was actually opened. So this means that, you know, how tight the situation was for the authorities at the time. But it meant that these became huge local debates, often, you know, a little bit more or less dramatic depending on the place, but, but it became a nationwide uh, phenomenon. I would say that the largest change that took place in 2015, or as a result of that, was actually uh, that, for example, myself, who has been working in, let's say, migration-related issues, um, well, it, it's about sort of uh, 20 years, more or less, uh, by today. So after that, I have never had to argue that, you know, why, why, why what I'm doing is somehow important and why people should listen to me. Everybody listens to me now. I don't know if they understand what I'm saying. That's a different thing, but, uh, but you know, it simply became important. And I think this is a very uh, uh, big change. Here you see the, the numbers. I didn't break down these to gender. It was majority uh, a, a male, also you know, a couple of thousand uh, under, underage arrivals and, and so on. But there you see in comparison to 2015 to 2016, uh, 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 last year was you know, so-called normal numbers. Uh, sorry for this being in Finnish language. It's so far the simplest and uh, uh, illustration of what happened to these people in, in one way. If I would have put down a chart <coughs> showing in which points of Finnish administration, NGO services, or whatever the asylum seekers would be, it would take me half an hour to explain the chart out because it's rather complicated. But here we see um, uh, uh, on the left side up, that's uh, um, re people are returned to other uh, uh, EU countries, yeah, no, sort of Dublin type of thing. Uh, the one on the uh, upper uh, upper right side are those uh, who will uh, uh, be uh, granted asylum in Finland. So approximately one third, you know, it's it's around there. Uh, then. Um, to the right side, downwards corner, it's uh, the paperless, as uh, uh, these individuals are now, you know, no uh, right to stay, but uh, people still stay, okay? And the others, uh, uh, you know, go somewhere, okay? So, uh, we don't know the exact figures yet because uh, the processes are still in process. So, uh, um, even though a lot of new people have been hired to do the actual uh, decisions on these asylum applications, there's still, uh, uh, um, I, would, I would actually say, quite a bit of uncertainty about the sort of exact outcomes of this. But, but you know, we can say roughly that, you know, maybe around half will go and then uh, less than a half somehow will, will, will stay in Finland. Between one third and a half, I think it will end up in there. And this, is, this has been the big discussion in Finland, and I will return to this uh, uh, quite, quite soon and why that is the case. Because the number of undocumented migrants, the so-called paperless, uh, has been very low 
Now, I was here also last year, and I don't know if you remember, but I remember that myself. And I was trying to tell you about the sort of uh, social psychology of the, the receiving population, of what, you know, how did we feel at the time. And I will recall this, and I ended up with a question, which is here the number five, what next? And I will soon come to that. But I was kind of like summarizing that, you know, this took us uh, um, all by surprise. You know, even though we were just earlier this morning reminded that no, it didn't, it wasn't a surprise to everyone, but you know, in reality, it was a surprise to everyone, at least how it exactly uh, uh, took shape. So it was a shock, and there was a lot of compassion. We have these people fleeing, we need to help them. Very much compassion and rather quick, different forms of grassroots mobilizations around, was it uh, delivering water bottles or what, 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 whatever. The second thing, especially from the side of public administration, was you know, how on earth do we scale up the system that is not uh, tailored to receive so many people coming, especially in such a rapid pace. You know, rem remember, you know, it was, uh, the, the, the largest numbers actually came at the time about one month's time. It was a huge peak. You know, how do, we, do you actually deal with that? And that's when you know the people were very tired and, uh, and, and, and so on. But also it led to a lot of uh, mobilization. It led mobilization in two ways. On the one hand, uh, in the sort of humani humanitarian side of helping other people, you know, uh, yes, we will do our best to the extent that local newspapers in the city where I live uh, had to deliver the message from the reception center, please don't send us any more clothes. You know, we, we simply cannot deal with them anymore. We will organize it in a different way. And there were angry people, you know, writing to the newspaper that, I wanted to go and help, but my, my help wasn't accepted. Yeah. There were too many people who wanted to help at the time, from the point of view of those who were actually doing the things. Then, you know, uh, as this continued and continued, especially in the media, you know, we, we had these images, people, you know, the flows, the hordes of people coming from south. You know, does it end? You know, uh, is it like an... Uh, endless population stream to here or not. And then we came to the, to the idea that was in the Nordic countries, symbolized in my perspective, but you know, kind of like closing the bridge uh, or restricting the, its mobility in reality between uh, uh, Denmark and Sweden. That was a very uh, big and quite dramatic turning point. And after that, we have seen then what we are Going to, what I'm going to talk about now. So this is more about now about the sort of policy responses. I won't bore you with details. They are all documented. If you, for example, see other reports produced by the European Migration Network, there you can find all the decisions and so on. I'll just pick up a few things. What we saw was a tightening of everything, making everything more difficult from the asylum seekers' perspective, that is. Uh, deportation. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, referring back to the same um, project, or, you know, it's, it's not a commission, but a group that is working on this carrying capacity of Finland. So I've heard uh, several police officers state in that, that context that, you know, <clears throat> we are actually very proud of that, that we have made our deportation systems much more effective than they were. But nobody's talking about this in the media. So these individuals are a little bit upset that their hard work hasn't been noticed in this case. Okay, so you see, deportation made more effective. Second one, granting, granting asylum has become, uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, more difficult. And how, how was that done? So in the case of Finland, uh, one um, way, we may also discuss that, you know, because this is what people in the um, immigration service, for example, say that the profile of these people who came was qualitatively different to those who arrived earlier, and that's why we see far less uh, granted uh, uh, asylums than in some uh, residence permits than in some other cases. It may also be so, but nevertheless, redefining uh, the sort of regulations by which you uh, um, judge the individuals, so uh, you know, declaring certain areas of, for example, Iraq as safe places to return, and previously they were not. Kind of like, you know, technical changes in the background, but then when, we, when you look at the actual outcome, you see 
uh, what I would call a very dramatic drop in the number of granted asylum you know, for particular nationalities. Um, then another one, uh, um, family reunification, which has been then uh, um, a major way of, of entry, especially among uh, people of, broadly speaking, uh, people of refugee background. So it has been uh, quite a significant way. So what did we see there? Uh, well, making it uh, so difficult that it's close to impossible in reality for you to uh, 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 apply for ra family reunification. Again, I'm not going to the technicalities, but the outcome of that is that it's actually really, really hard to actually being able to apply, not even to qualify for the criteria that were also changed. So we see, and this goes kind of like across the board. We could take some other issues, so it's become simply more difficult. Now, and of course, like it's everywhere, so there is a story behind. You know, why did this, why did, why did it happen like that? Now, um, won't bore you with the details of Finnish politics, but let's say that in our current government, uh, there is uh, uh, the party of the Finns, also known as the True Finns, that have, uh, uh, have had, uh, um, uh, broadly speaking, refugee-related issues as a very central part of their agenda. So. Uh, uh, um, part of these changes that were uh, implemented resonate very well with the uh, political agenda of this party. I, uh, my, my impression there are also other background factors, but we see a new type of ideological or political influences coming into the way how, uh, how policies are, are made. So, <clears throat> uh, and, and this relates to my uh, next point. So I'm seeing a, a, a kind of like new type of balance emerging, maybe quite in a quite particular way in Finnish refugee policy, where uh, uh, the the uh, sort of balance of idealism, the balance of you know what we should actually, uh, what we should do, you know how the world would be a better place, contra to the other aspect that, you know, what, what we actually can do, you know, what is realistic for our efforts to see that what, what, in what way they might uh, work. Okay, Finland has a reputation of, of being rather pragmatic. And um, especially uh, now one of the outcomes, we don't know it over the long term yet, but this seems to be the case, so I feel safe enough to argue for that, that one of the outcomes of tightening asylum criteria, um, one tool for that was uh, leaving one kind of like a technical visa type away from the opportunities that you could grant to the, uh, to the individuals. Uh, uh, meant that um, we have, in a way, ourselves created the uh, emerging issue of the paperless in Finnish society. Because had we applied the prior criteria, it's uh, in any way, I think, uh, quite likely that the number, in this case, of the paperless would not have grown to the extent as it seems to grow. Okay, this is a little bit of a thin ice because we don't know about all the figures, figures and, uh, but it seems that uh, the, the uh, um, uh, seems to be the case. Okay. So, I'll wrap it up. <clears throat> what happened to the asylum seekers of 2015? Well, we cannot fully answer the question yet. It will take a bit more time uh, so that we even get past the initial phase of people having all their final decisions and so on. Probably during the next year or so, we can see that. Then over the long-term integration issues, that is of course uh, far more complicated and it will take uh, uh, more time. What we know, many returned. What do we know about them? Very little. Uh, in most cases, we have no clue. So we cannot say what happened to these people because we have no monitoring system to tell that you know whether it was a, a good thing or not. For those who stay in Finland, we do have some some tracking devices, like uh, uh, we all know. Many are still in a, in a rather unsolved situation, unclear. Are they able to stay? Yes, no, and so on. Then we do know the practical issues that, you know, among the larger nationalities were Somalis, Iraqis, uh, especially Iraqis and Afghans. You know, these communities that are pre-existent in the country will grow and, uh, uh, and diversify also internally. And undocumented are far more. 
Okay, so we don't know about certain things. We don't know about the impact of making, for instance, uh, family reunification more, more diffic difficult. That, you know, what are the sort of psychological impacts for these individuals? It's kind of like a, a, a uh, sociological test, you know, we, we, we compare a cohort in the future of those who were able to uh, reunify with their family and those who were not able to do that. Maybe we can then say the outcome. The, what we do know from before is that it's probably going to be a, a more, maybe more challenging for these individuals who don't have, in a way, uh, their families uh, with that. And then, again, you know, uh, a new ideologies seem to be, at least for the current time, steering some of the, the, the political decision-making in this area compared to before. And finally, this is it. So uh, the previous speaker mentioned about a forthcoming report. I'm very happy to announce that the report was actually published yesterday. Uh, looks like this. It will just come out of print. That we, we, so this is an overview of uh, migration and uh, integration research in the, in the Nordic uh, region. It's uh, available at Nordforsk's uh, website, and two of the, its authors are present here. I have uh, done a little bit of contribution myself, and Johanna Leinonen, who is sitting in this room, is also present. So I thank you. I think we are going to have a long day, but I hope it's going to be excellent. Thank you. Thank you. But we still have uh, time for uh, two or three questions. So any questions in the audience? Please, yeah. And, and Vatili, you, you and HCR, uh, what do we know about family, uh, family importance of family reunification is that we know the effect of family separation also in terms of inclusion. So we know that people who are separated from their family have difficulties to settle and to find job and to learn the language, so that, that we know. Um, uh, what about this distinction, idealism versus pragmatism that is often used in the media and political discourse? Um, how can you explain, because from an integration point of view, when we see the number of restrictions in Nordic countries, such as reduction of uh, resident permits or family reunification, it seems that, again, from an integration perspective, that it's a lack of pragmatism. That it's a kind of idealism to think that these people will be able to integrate in very precarious situations. So, what, what, what do you, yes, how would you, what would you say about this? Uh, I have a very brief answer. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Very brief answer. So, is there any more questions? I, I have one question. Uh, as you said, the monitoring system is not in place, uh, but I guess you still have some monitoring system, or how you what is your opinion about uh, monitoring the radicalization issues? Because this is a kind of uh, issue that is very hot in, in Europe, that uh, how, to, how to follow this, how to find out when the radicalization is taking place. It's very often it's happening in the second generation and so on. Uh, what's the situation in Finland in this sense? Um, thank you. Uh, I was referring with the monitoring system, you know, just the regular sort of statistical yes. or otherwise, uh, how you follow up, up, up people or groups of people. Um, on the uh, radicalization issues, of course, it has also been discussed in Finland, and uh, I, uh, there are different type of policies um, in that. I'm not aware of any uh, really systematic monitoring system. To me, it seems more like... Uh, that uh, you know, security uh, officers and uh, maybe also people from the social work side of things or school teachers uh, are today more aware of uh, where to be in touch with in case they meet some individuals who in their eyes uh, you know, behave or think in, in, in worrying ways. And there are also some uh, projects that uh, are working in different parts of the country that aim to improve, kind of like the 
capacity of, of uh, to identify individuals with uh, with uh, uh, such such uh, interests. Uh, and then uh, I think on the sort of a more secretive side of monitoring, uh, uh, it's my understanding. I really don't know um, that you know. Um, security police must be following uh, social media websites or I don't know particular individuals who come to the country and you know whom they meet and so on so um, okay yeah. thank you